Our next guest is a former Rolling Stone editor and a veteran music journalist, and for her most recent project, she's telling the story of one of rock's greatest unsung heroes. Here to discuss her new book, A Man Called Destruction, the life and music of Alex Chilton, from box tops to big stars to backdoor man, mm -hmm. is Holly George Warren. Welcome to Arise 360. Hi, how are you? Okay, Good. Alex Chilton, he's not a household name, but he's no, one he's of the not. most influential rockers of all time. Why don't we know more about him? Well, he kind of hid behind the music, I think, in a way. We know a lot of his songs, but we don't know the name Alex Chilton. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had the number one hit um, for a month in America the summer of 1967 with The Letter, yeah. with his band The Box Tops. Right. So, and in fact, you know, he was this skinny white boy from Memphis. People thought he was a 40-year-old black man. He had this very raspy voice. Voice. And he had several other big hits with the box tops. Then in the 70s, he had a group called Big Star, which again, um, not many people knew his name, although some connected him to the box tops, but he sounded so different in Big mm. Star, more like of a beatle kind of a sound. Mm. So for those who aren't more familiar with him, how would you sum him up and his music? Well, he was one of those people that was kind of ahead of the curve in all the changes in pop music. Like I said, beginning in 67, kind of the last of the boy bands put together by producers, songwriters. Then he was one of the first of the real visionary artists that um, kind of tried to create something that they really felt was in their heart without trying to follow a trend. Mm -hmm. And that's what Big Star was all about. And some very dark, very intimate um, lyrics and things like that. Didn't sell any records, but it was one of those groups that all these fledgling musicians who heard it went on to start bands like R.E.M. and Wilco, Yola Tango, Flaming Lips, all these indie rock bands. Mm -hmm. And then same thing, he continued on kind of just following his muse, didn't matter what was popular, um, you know, he just wanted to play the kind of music that spoke to him. Now, you actually met him. Is that one of the reasons you decided to dedicate an entire book to him? <laughs> well, and I, tell us a story about how you met him, because I understand that it didn't end so well. <laughs> well no, it, it, was, it was fine. Um, I knew him f for many years, but I first met him, yes, when I was just this tourist walking through the streets of the French Quarter for the first time, doing what people do in the French Quarter. Which is? And, you know, checking out the different <laughs> famous bars there. Uh -huh. And he was already kind of a cult figure among musicians that I knew, so of course I knew knew the big star records even though you know I had them on audio cassette taped from the vinyl and I was with a friend who had known him in Memphis and he came over and I'm like oh my gosh this is Alex Jones he had on a dishwasher shirt because he had completely given up music at that point and was washing oh. dishes in New Orleans my wow. but uh, he took us on a little tour of uh, the bars of the French Quarter and then years later when he did start playing again he was in New York I had a little group then called Clam Bake and he actually agreed to produce an EP we were recording. Are you serious? So, and then I became a music journalist and got to interview him for some magazines and oh. things like that. So I knew him in different ways over the years. And over the years you became friends. Now I heard a story, tell me if this is true, about uh -oh. you throwing up in his sink. Was that on one of those bar hopping trips? <laughs> My son is watching this. <laughs> okay, it didn't really happen, it's just in the book. No. Yes, we ended up, our car was towed when I first met him. I was like 22 years old and our car was towed after a night of drinking. <laughs> And drinking, um, you know, the Hurricanes, the famous French uh, Quarter drinks. Uh, Not course. good for you. Happened to the best uh. of us, girl. I think I'm blushing now. No. <laughs> Don't worry. I've been hurricaned myself. So, uh -oh. But he was, he was very kind about it. It was so embarrassing to throw up in the sink of this cult figure who was like this incredible musician, but he never held it against me. In fact, I think it made him like me better. And made a great story, <laughs> yeah. so there you go. What do you think Alex would make of today's current sound mm. and um, all of the babies that their group spawned? I think he would love the all the different types of music mm -hmm. that um, like kids are into today. It's such a melting pot of sounds because he never stayed with one kind of music. I mean, he loved black gospel music, he loved old-timey country and western music, he loved Chet Baker style jazz, punk rock, I mean he loved all kinds of music and today we're, we have all that at our fingertips thanks to you know the internet, yeah. we can check out anything we want. So I think he would really appreciate that. At the end of his life, and he only you know lived to be 59, he was very much into Baroque classical music. So mm -hmm. I haven't really seen that come too much into pop music, but you never know. Well, for someone who was so critically acclaimed, why didn't he ever reach that peak in popular yeah. culture? Well, fortunately, one of his songs actually was used as a theme song for that 70s show. So. 
he was able to live very nicely off the residuals near the end of his life. But mm. really, he was never inspired just to try to make money. He just played music because he loved music. I mean, mm. he was a fan as much as he was an artist. And I think that was his motivation more mm. than trying to, you know, get ahead or whatever. Because he did have those hits. When he was a teenager, mm -hmm. he was the top of the charts. And he realized the fleeting nature of fame in that way and that it was mm -hmm. kind of a shallow fame, and he really wanted to make the music that spoke to him internally. So Can you imagine somebody actually turning away from fame? <laughs> it would never happen this day. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, he did have many opportunities that he could have made a lot of money trading on some of his past success, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to do that. He mm -hmm. wanted to play the kind of music he wanted to play, write the kind of music he wanted to write, depending on you know, what his whim was at the time. Mm. So what's a, the quintessential song, if we're trying to get into Alex Chilton and we're mm -hmm. a bit behind, bring us up to speed well, on the music we must download. Depend, well, of course, The Letter mm -hmm. um, was a great hit with the box top. Soul Deep, another great song, Cry Like a Baby. And then with Big Star, his most popular one, I think, is September Girls, which is just a beautiful song. Um, 13 is a beautiful song about adolescence um, that is wonderful. Nighttime, a gorgeous song. I mean, so many. And then later in life, he did some kind of crazy, or punky kind of songs like Bangkok, which is a little wacky, but fun. Okay. <laughs> so there's, right. there's so much to choose from. I think there are some Alex Chilton playlists on Spotify that some fans have done. So you can really sample all these different styles because okay. he was all over the musical map. The guy did not stick with one sound ever. All right. Well, while people are listening to his music, they can get to know the man behind the music by li reading your book, A Man Called Destruction. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we appreciate thank it. Thank you for helping to spread the word about Alex Chilton's music. Yeah, no problem. All right. You. And we'll be right back with more Rise 360.